Lord, we are here because you pay that debt. We are here because you, Lord Jesus, is real in our lives, because your life has transformed ours, because you have given us a second chance, because through that we are able to be alive. Lord, we praise you and worship you because you are real, because you are bigger than any problem that we present to you, because you are bigger than our anxiety and our fears. And God, we come today to listen to your word and be transformed by that. And through that, God, we pray that your Holy Spirit will come and touch and pursue our hearts. In your name we pray. Amen. You may be seated. Here we are in the basics again, in the beginning, with all these uh, different things that we're learning from the first book of the Bible, and that is, all right, Genesis. Genesis, okay, Genesis, very good. How many chapters are in this book? We talked about it last week. Fifty. Fifty. 50. And we have learned in this book, that is the book of beginnings in many sections, we learn at the, be at the very beginning of the beginning of the first book, we learn that God has done very good things. Are you aware of that? God has provided good things, and that teaches to us about the nature of our God. It's a good God with good things. What are one of those things that you enjoy about creation? Think about it. What are some of those things? You, hmm? Trees, sun, yeah, salsa, yes. coffee, yeah. <laughs> we enjoy many things from God, and you know, and that is constantly what, what happens is sometimes I feel that we, we forget how is it that we're receiving everything. Why do we pray before every meal? We pray to give him thanks, but could it be that also we should pray saying, this is just a moment to celebrate your creation, and we're able to enjoy this meal because in your creativity, God, we can cook different kinds of meal, and that is good. So I want you to see in every aspect of your life the goodness of our God. We also learn about Ezer Kenegdo. You remember this word in Hebrew? What does it mean? It's helper, but remember, it's about a safeguard. It's another person who's coming next to, to the Lord to come and be part of that creation. We are that. We are next to God, supporting, helping on this process of creation and stewardship of what God has given us. We need to do a good job about that. We need to, sometimes I feel convicted and I need to remember, this is recycled, this is recycled, because I want to be a person who honors the world where God is calling us to serve. But we also learn other things through this. And we're going to learn today through the magic of Minecraft. <laughs> other of the things that they can do, the kids in Minecraft. Again, I keep asking, is there any adult here that knows what I'm talking about when I say Minecraft? Everybody knows. Now confess who plays Minecraft. You know, okay. You know, I have the honest people here. So with Minecraft, we're learning about the rainbow. And uh, you see, this is the story of somebody that all of us, we have heard in the Bible. And that's the story of Noah. Very good. Now, sometimes we do not honor the story as it should be. We go to two extremes. One group of people take this story as this cute story of Noah with all these different animals, and they are all getting to the ark. It's so cute that we put it on paper wall for the kids at school. Really nice. But doesn't quite show us the point. Then, but if you think in the story on the other side, it's kind of dark. I mean, think about that. The only ones alive were in that ark. Everyone else and all the other creation gone. It's too dark. So when you go to any of those extremes, you are not able to really see who is God and the purpose and the deeper purpose of this story. One of the main and most important things that we learn for the first time through this story is that the God that we have is a God of covenant. And I want you to hear that because the fact that we have a God of covenant is an anchor for our faith to keep walking in this world because that helps us to know the nature of our, our God. Covenant is also important to know that in Hebrew, buried, is this war because there were other kinds of covenant, but in the specific way with God, we will always learn that sometimes there are different kinds of covenant. The Bible has over 280 
just in the Old Testament, plus 30 in the New Testament. So you're talking about hundreds of covenants. Some of them are unilateral. One is the one giving the promise, not expecting anything. In other cases, he said, okay, you do this, then there is this effect. But one thing with God is he's always the one carrying the weight of the covenant. He's carrying the most difficult thing to do, and we are just responding to that. This nature of God allowed us to have hope in our lives from that time in the beginning of the Bible to the day today. Because the covenant existed due to something that we all confront, and that is sin. We also know the story about Adam and Eve. And we tell the story of the serpent, and also you can see there are a lot of drawings about it. Let me just be very clear about one point, because many times I have heard that it's blame on Eve. Where was Adam when this was happening? Watching football! You are right! <laughs> I think he was distracted, uh, Dennis, because he was standing up next to Eve, doing nothing. You see, he's just looking, maybe he was thinking in the score, Dallas lost, man. Uh, oh, what is Eve doing? Oh, oh, you see, totally in another planet. Not that men do that. It was just Adam, all the other men are connected to the world 100%, right? So what happened is, in this process, we broke that connection and relationship with God. Sean Gladding, in the book I recommend to you, says this, that really, I never heard it in that way, and really makes me think. The subtle serpent taps into our deepest anxiety as humans. The fear that what I have, no matter how good it may be, is not enough. Isn't it true? That's how we get tempted. It doesn't matter what kind of temptation you confront, we all go through that point of thinking, I want more, I want more. And, and even think about this, in, in that process, you forget what you have and what you're thankful for. So you see, instead of her looking at all the creation that God has given to them, the place where they are, the relationship they have with God, the connection, the Esther connect on this beautiful creation, she focused on just, she wanted that more. And when we think about where tension comes in the world, it's because we want more. And the problem is when we get to the place where we say, if I get this, will be enough, what happens? It's not enough. And then we grow and that brings more tension. And you see, as we shared last time, because of this, it creates tension. I wish if you can, after you come and give worship in here, I want you next week to listen to the sermon that Pastor Dan preached today because he talked a little bit about this same section. What happens when we sin? When we sin, we talked last week about isolation. Let me tell you a truth that sometimes we don't want to accept. But when we are in sin, it doesn't matter if you did it, hide it under the drum set in the back, we will know. We will know because your behavior will not be in Esther Connecto, in connection with others. Because when we disconnect from God, when we start thinking about this is not enough and I want more, we lose the focus of why we are here. And the other consequence is that we actually break any relationship. We break the relationship with God. And because you need to hide that sin, you will break relationship with people. If you want to accept that or not, it is a fact. It will break us. We cannot be behaving in the same way. Notice it. Think about it. When you have been in those dark moments of sin, what do you do? You disconnect from others. It hurts me this one a lot because when we are called to be Nessar Connect, though, what happens is we move to selfish behavior. I see that more in cultural sins. I believe this. I believe God puts specific gifts to different cultures. And I believe that he uses every culture in different ways. This is why I'm such a strong advocate about bilingual students or the more languages and cultures you know the best. Because I believe that God manifests in different ways to each culture. And through that, he speaks to the people according to the way they understand. 
So when you can provide to a child more than one culture to learn, to know, more than what language, you're allowing that child to learn to see God beyond just one, one group of people. Does it make sense? So there are certain things that we are stronger in one culture than others. And what happens is when we are in this scene as cultures, we also heard that Esther connect though. For example, Mexicans, we are known as community-oriented culture. We like to have people around. We talk about the big familias. But when we are in sin, what we do is we move to a very selfish behavior. And instead of thinking in community, we start thinking just in ourselves. This country of the United States is a country that is about giving to others. And we have the American dream. But when we are in sin, it becomes more of like, what can I do regardless if I need to step in another person? So all of us culturally, we also have places for needs redemption. And all of this always brings violence. And we can see that from the first book of the Bible. Remember what happened to Abel, not my Abel, the Abel of the Bible. <laughs> His brother killed him. The father of Noah, Lamech, he also was a killer. So we learn about violence since the beginning of the scripture as the consequence of sin. So what do we do with that reality? And the reality that we still carry that. The reality is that also with that, we always have a yet in the Bible or but. And when God says yet, there is a transformation in what God is doing about that reality. And while we all were in sin, yet there is a covenant, a call that God gives to all of us. A covenant is an agreement between God and man initiated by God. The problem is, my brothers and sisters, is that covenant for our cultures is not something that we understand that deep as it was in the beginning or as it was in Genesis. But covenant is not just a document. It's also a relationship and in connection with others. Also, I like what Sean says here. He says, when what we do deserves death, God insists on life for us. Do you see that? How beautiful reality we have in God. We deserve death. The scripture says that. On Romans 6.23 tells us, For the wages of sin is, but the gift of, the, of God is what? Eternal life in Christ Jesus our Lord. That's where we move. That is the reality that we have and the hope that we receive and the hope that we give. So when we see all of this in context, then we can understand the story of Noah very different. Also, think about time frame here, right? Okay, here is Noah, and he's called as the only one who's following God. He's probably already feeling isolated. I don't know how many of you in your family are, is the only Christian. And sometimes you feel very isolated because of that truth. And you feel like, okay, nobody around me understands my faith. Well. Don't worry, Noah got it. He was, it says the scripture, he was one of the few walking with God, following God. And then the Lord calls him to do something totally weird. He says, go and build an, an ark. Now, how many arks were there before? When, I mean, how, how often did it rain? Never. It was the first time that rain was going to happen. And here is his building something that nobody has ever seen before. Do you realize how people were looking at him? I'm like, what are you doing? What's the purpose of this? And now think about how long did it take to do that? And, and he's building that. And God is giving a promise. The animals are going to come, and you're going to put them inside, and you're going to put your family inside. So when this happens, then it starts raining. I love in the scripture how it says, and then the Lord came and closed the door. I almost felt like that father figure who comes and goes with his child and puts the covers over the child to be sure that he's well. It's almost like he's closing that door as a way to say, I'm protecting you. For how long did it rain? 40 days and 40 nights. But if you read deeper, that, that, that's a lot of rain. That's a lot of rain. You see, I have no military experience, but I have seen you guys who have that military experience. And I'm thinking, I think that for, Moses, for Noah, he was feeling almost if he was in convent, convent. That's the way you said? He was for 40 nights and 40 days just listening to this rain constantly. 
listening probably to the animals and the people around him, listening that and looking around and saying, this is not stopping. We know it was 40 days and 40 nights. He didn't. We know, we know that there was a moment when that stopped. He quite didn't know when that was going to happen. And then don't think that after 40 days and 40 nights of rain, he just said, oh, it finished. Okay, open, let's go. Everybody out. Okay, the cows, the lion. No, he did not. He needed to wait till all the water went down. You know how long did that take? He ended one year stuck in that ark with children, with his family, with all this one year. Now it sounds all nice and cute, but think about what did you feel? What did you feel when you were looking around and the only thing that you see is water? I even remember one time driving on I-10 going through Louisiana. And there is that section when there is nothing but water around. Have you guys been there? I hate it. I'm from Monterrey, mountains, big mountains, floor around you, great. I was there, and there were moments when I was feeling a, a little bit of anxiety because I'm thinking, if these things break, we're going to the water. <laughs> this is not fun. So think about Noah around that place where he's just looking and saying, there is nothing around but water for one year. I strongly believe, without making this just a uh, statement, is he did actually have PTSD after that because he gets out of it and after one year, and, and what do you feel? How do I know really that this is not gonna happen again? H how am I sure that we're not going to get back to this place? And God creates a covenant, unilateral covenant. And I almost feel that God is involved emotionally with Noah. He's thankful for his commitment, but at the same time he knew this is a little bit traumatic for him. He goes down, and when he starts looking around, the first thing that Noah does, and I love that, and few people talk about that. If you see what he did, as soon as he went down, what was it? He did an altar, and he presented an offering to God. In the midst of the darkness of that rain, and one year to be stuck in that ark, he never forget who called him to do that. He never forget that the one who took him through all this trial was a faithful God and he offered an offering to him in there. My brothers and sisters, when we go through trials and difficulties and we feel like I am in those 40 nights and 40 days or that you're stuck in the ark, maybe right now you feel that you are stuck in the ark. I invite you that in the moment the Lord says, step out and walk, just take a moment to say, Lord, I praise you because you are real, because you have been walking with me in the midst of this time in the ark where I was stuck, while I was looking things around that were very difficult. But because of you, I'm able to be out of there. So it is the rainbow that reminds us we were able to step out and praise God. And this is not something that ended just in the Old Testament. Just last week, I saw this rainbow. It's God telling us constantly, my purpose, and this is an important concept from God, the purpose that God has for us is not destruction, it's redemption. And God is redeeming us through that. Now, as I said, perhaps one of the things that are difficult is to understand covenant. We have covenants today. We probably could even call them, they are part of our sacraments. But think about covenant we do with children. Many times people ask us, why the United Methodist Church baptize children? And, and it took me a while to understand that and learn about it. But I learned it because I can see more. It's a covenant from God to say, I am going to bless the life of this child. And it's a covenant from the parents saying, you know, I am going to bless this kid. And it's a covenant of all of us of the church saying, 
We are blessing these kids. These were my kids when they were shorter than me. Now they are bigger than me. And you guys are part of the covenant. And the reason why we baptize our kids here with you guys is because I trust you. I trust you that you're going to help me raising Pedro and Elizabeth to grow in their faith and to embrace their Christian faith. And we have done many other Christians. This is Pastor Dan too uh, with uh, one Jennifer when we uh, baptized Kylie. And what does Kylie do during this time? This is Piper. <laughs> what do we do? What does the children do during that time? Are they able to stand up as little babies and say, yes, I take this covenant that God is providing for me? They don't care about that. They just care that the water is not too cold when we're baptizing them. But it is in that baptism when that person who's incapable to talk, we are around that person. We are bringing a covenant of we are helping you to grow in your faith that keeps his life going. That's how God is with us. We cannot sometimes express all of our needs, but the Lord is there for us providing his hope to all of us so we can walk in our lives. God is a God of covenant who has initiative. This is what's important to know. This is not something that I need to do. It's something that God is starting always for me. The covenant of God is also the assurance to preserve humankind and creation. As I said, the God that we have is not a God of destruction. It's a God of redemption. And one of the great things about this is that the Lord wants us to flourish. He says he wants you to have a life and a life in abundance. Not a limited survival, but a life in abundance. One of the things that I enjoy more about him being um, that God of covenant is that through this, I know that God is pursuing us. Do you understand that word? Pursuing is not going to give up. This week, I had the opportunity to visit Sonia's family, and it was a blessing to be there. And she shared to me a story that I told her, oh, you're just preaching my sermon. So I'm taking that story. She has these two beautiful little dogs. They are very cute, hairy, and they look at me like, Mexican food, Mexican food. But I'm like, no, no, I'm just a pastor. And then uh, we, they, they were very cute, and, and I could see how protective they were of the, of, of the owners, right? So, but Sonia was telling me the story of one of these dogs. She told me that she bought the dog to have her in her lap and just to be this indoor dog, very cute, because she's very small, right? What kind of dog is it? Like a Maltese, right? Chihuahua, a Chihuahua dog. She's super cute, super cute. But the thing is, she had all the desire to be an indoor dog. The problem is the dog didn't have the desire to be an indoor dog because outside there was another dog, right? And she was attracted to that big dog outside. So the little dog decided to say, I want to be an outdoor dog. And even though, I mean, Sonia tried everything to keep the dog inside, the dog wanted to go outside. So they ended saying, fine, go out, right? And I love her story of Sonia. She says, you can see them in the rain, the big dog just with all the rain on him and the little dog next to it. You saw in all the rain, but wanted to be outside. Until one day, I think the big dog died. And uh, Sonia didn't give up on this little dog and say, come inside. And they wash her and clean her. And now she is so beautiful back indoor. But you see, the key here is Sonia didn't give up to let that dog be outside and be all dirty and smelly. She did not give up. And when she's telling me that story, I'm saying, Sonia, you're just preaching the sermon because that's what God is with us. How many of us are that, like that little dog saying, God, I know you have plans for my life. I know that you have told me that you gave your life for me. I know you have great things for me, but I want to go outside. You know, it doesn't matter that through you I have a life in abundance and I have an eternal life and through you I can find myself with identity. I want to go outside. And we get there and we are all dirty. And she says, in soquete, it's, true, it's a good it's a Spanish word, just nasty, stinky. We are outside because we want to be with that big dog that I have no clue who he was, but we just want to hang out there instead of being in the light. But you see, while the humanity will tell us, well, that's your consequence, now you stay there. When there was the moment when we had the maturity to say, this is not helping me. This is not getting me anywhere. 
and say, God, can you accept me? Before you even ask, God is already opening the door and say, come back in. Let me refresh you, wash you, clean you, and let you have a life that is restored. That is the God that you and I have, my brothers and sisters. A God of covenant who's pursuing and looking for you. And he's not going to give up. He's going to show you his love in the way he can. Because he created you with love. And I want you to quiet down any voice that will try to say that your life has no value. Because he's searching for you. I love this picture. Psalm 23 says, and goodness and mercy, what does it do? Follow me. I am so thankful for that because I lost my keys all the time. I lost things. But to know that the goodness of mercy is not something I need to be looking for, but it's something that is following me, praise the Lord. Because he's going to be there for us where we need it. This doesn't end there. In the New Testament, we remember our Lord Jesus Christ. He says, this is my blood of the covenant, which is poured out for many for the forgiveness of sins. It is through that covenant, that agreement, that pursuing of God to us, that we have a new life. You see, I work in a kindergarten. I was a teacher aide of three-year-old kids. They are cute, but when you have 50 in one chunk, they are not cute. They are very hard. But I remember one of the things they did is they had this, this funny song about a mouse. And one of the kids was the mouse. And they would sing the song. And after the song, the little kid that was the mouse needed to run and look for another one and hug that guy and say, now you are the mouse. So the idea was that as soon as they finished the song, all the other kids, they will run as fast as they can so nobody will catch them. Except one day. When the parents were around and they would come and we do a presentation, I noticed a change of the behavior of the kids. That when the mouse was going to run, everybody kind of stood in the way. So the mouse could come and catch them and be part of the story. You see what it makes me think? I wish we are those kids when the parents are around before God. I wish that we say to God, I am not running anymore. Catch me. Pursue me. Catch me. I need you. I need you to be entering in covenant with you. I need to remember the relationship that I have with you. I need you to open the door again and let me go in and take the life that you have promised to me. I need you not just as a person, but as a, but as a person who lives in the United States with a new president. And I want to say that in the midst of the tension that we have in this country right now, I want to be one person, one citizen, one immigrant that is standing up to pursue the love of God and through that be empowered to make a difference in this place and say, while there is tension, I find hope in God. And through Him, even if I disagree or agree with this government, I can be a positive influence in this society because of the love of the Lord Jesus Christ for me. So it is our invitation to you. Don't run. Let him catch you. Allow him to pursue you and live in covenant with him. Amen. Listen to this song where you're. I'm not going to ask you to stand up. Just pray this song in your heart. But you love me anyway. Oh. It's like nothing in life. 